Welcome back, ESS. We're finishing up Unit 2. This is the last set of notes, 2.5. And we're going to talk a little bit about surface processes, geomorphology, erosion, and weathering. So let's get started. Weathering, term you've heard before, this should be a review, the physical breakdown or the chemical breakdown and changing of rocks at or near the Earth's surface. This is a big part of the rock cycle, and it involves taking material and turning it into smaller material. Ultimately, it will be transported and deposited elsewhere. Here's a beautiful photograph from the desert southwest, and you can see some of the sandstone layers here. And above that, this is a shale layer that forms a little bit more gentle slope. And the agents here, when you have rain and wind and ice and gravity, are all going to take its toll and weather these rocks down and move them. Chemical weathering specifically results in an actual chemical change of the original rock itself. Almost always, that's going to involve water. So what you've got here is this beautiful limestone layer. And this lake here is clearly somewhat acidic. And that acidic water slowly eats away at the limestone layers down here. And you're forming these cool columns and cave formations. And you get the ultimate um, dissolving of the rocks. And that material is uh, dissolved in the water, and then it is transported and deposited elsewhere. So that is chemical weathering. Compare that to mechanical weathering, also called physical weathering, is the breakdown of rock and soil through physical processes. Literally taking a rock and using physical agents and wearing them down. For example, this river... The stream is cutting along this cliff face here. So it's not doing any dissolving, but it's just breaking down the rock and the sediments. And ultimately, that material is going to get weathered and transported by the river itself. So you differentiate between the chemical weathering, where the sediments and the rocks get dissolved, and the mechanical or physical weathering, where the rocks just get broken down into smaller pieces. Erosion use that term already in the previous slides because it goes hand in hand with weathering. But erosion is the actual transport, the moving away. So this sandstone layer here near Arches National Park, really neat rock formation. The weathering was done primarily by wind, a process called sand blasting. But all of the sand grains from this sandstone layer Almost all of them have been eroded away and transported away. They're not here at the base of this cool formation and this table rock formation, but rather they have been transported, and that is indeed what erosion is referring to. Mass wasting. This is the type of erosion that involves gravity. So here in North Texas, where things are relatively flat, we don't get mass wasting. But areas where you have um, substantial steep slopes, mountains, topographical relief, you can get mass wasting. And they can be a variety that are slow, like creep and slump. Or you can have fast, dangerous, deadly, destructive ones, like a landslide, a rock slide, or a mud flow. And here it's, um, you can see the scale because of the houses down below here. So this hillside, this cliff face would probably be 500 feet high and the entire side of the mountain just failed and you had a landslide and unfortunately part of the neighborhood was buried here and there were a couple of fatalities where this happened. And that's all mass wasting. Next slide. This is an example of mass wasting. It's a very dangerous rock slide in Tennessee where an entire mountainside of solid granite broke free 
and came sliding down. Fortunately, there was a geologist on site. A few small pieces had broken off earlier that morning, so they were clearing the road, and a geologist had been called on site. And the geologist could tell and sense and hear the mountainside cracking and groaning and knew that more material was going to come sliding down. Let's watch it again. And they evacuated everybody, and there was no fatalities, and there wasn't even any injuries from this. But you can see the sheer volume and force involved with that rock slide or rock fall. Here's another example. This is a open pit, a rock quarry, and up along the rock face here, you can see it's beginning to fail. And fortunately, again, everyone had been evacuated because they knew this was happening. And you'll see the scale of this here in a minute when it pans down and you can actually see the earth movers at the bottom of the mine down there. This is another example of mass wasting, which is erosion due to gravity. And that earth mover probably was damaged quite heavily by that falling of the cliff face there. Quite dangerous. Again, here in North Texas, where everything's flat, we really don't have that. Frost wedging, another type of weathering, occurs when water will freeze in cracks um, in rocks. And it can do this on a large scale. It can do this on a small scale. But if you remember water, when it goes from liquid to solid, actually expands in volume by about 10%. So what happens is water can get into these little cracks. And at night in the desert, it'll freeze and it expands and actually breaks apart small sections and sometimes even large sections of rock. Usually what happens is frost wedging um, takes its toll, does its damage slowly over time because it happens on a small scale. But ultimately, that can lead to even more erosion and weathering on these cliff faces or in similar regions. Lastly, differential weathering. Not all rocks weather at the same rate. Some rocks can hold up against Mother Nature and others can erode very, very easily. If you have rocks that are strong and withstand erosion, they will weather and they will hold up and they will form vertical rock faces like this. If you have rocks that are not as resistant to weathering, they will form more gentle slopes like this. So what you've got here down below is probably a shale. The shales are made up of tiny microscopic sediments and they're very powdery and thin and they break away very easily. And up top, you probably have some sort, sort of sandstone or limestone or maybe even a lava layer that was on top because igneous rocks are actually very resistant to weathering compared to sedimentary rocks. Here's another example of Zion National Park. You have the largest layer in the park, and that's this one called the Navajo Sandstone, and it is over 1,000 feet thick, just to give you a sense of scale. Down in Zion National Park, you have the river, the stream, the Virgin River, which is doing the eroding and the carving. Underneath the Navajo Sandstone, you have the shale layer here, which is a much gentler slope and it erodes much more quickly. It doesn't withstand the test of time, but the sandstone does. And you can actually see the exact point right here where that contact is, where that strata, that bedding, that bedding plane is between the sandstone up above and the shale layer down below. But differential weathering can cause beautiful formations, particularly in the desert southwest of the United States. Grand Canyon is the maybe ultimate example of that. And when you see a cross-section of the Grand Canyon, 
you can see the vertical and then the sloped and then the vertical and then the sloped and then vertical and then sloped, vertical, sloped, vertical. Anywhere where they're sloped, generally a shale and is easily erodible. Anywhere where there's a vertical, it's much more resistant to weathering. For example, the red wall limestone or the Coconino sandstone near the top. So this photograph here taken with beautiful lighting um, from the sunrise. You can actually see the layers here that are resistant to weathering, and you can see the layers that are not resistant to weathering. And way down at the bottom of the Grand Canyon is the Inner Gorge, and that's actually made of a metamorphic rock, and it's incredibly resistant to weathering. So it is almost sheer vertical cliff face down near the bottom. All right. <clears throat> Thanks for watching and good luck.